champ is here. We will definitely not shut up and dribble. The champ is here. I must be the greatest. The champ is here. I'm going to continue to stand with the people. The champ is here. I will I not, not lose. lose. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. You've been anywhere in the world, but you're here with we. My name is EJ, and I got my man. I'm H. Yes, he is the DBS Show, and we are black in sports, giving a voice to the culture that won't shut up and dribble, here interviewing the best professionals in the game and in the boardroom, and, you know, we're covering it all, laughing at it all while providing a platform to be heard. All right, so you know what we do about this time, and no delay, we're going to jump right into it. We have to um, welcome our guest here. So, you know, he graduated summa cum laude, you know what I mean? So for those of you that aren't, like, really in tune and a little rusty in your Latin, that means he is truly the highest honor of high his praises, all right? And then in his life, I like to say he's like an ambassador. So he's an ambassador for change, all right? And that's kind of like his life motto, just outside looking in. And he's doing it for all the little boys and girls, right? So that means you too. Currently program manager um, at Google. Please clap it up for Malar Patel. Clap it up, clap it up. That boy good, that boy good. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for jumping on, man. I know busy times and uh, you're always doing some great stuff, man. Love following you, um, following you on LinkedIn and all the great work you've done. But uh how we start our show is we start our show with a shoot your shot moment. So this is a shoot your shot moment where you could have um, done something in your high school days, college days, or currently in your career, or it's how you got the misses. But we always like a shoot your shot moment. And it's something specific, right? Because, you know, some people try to cop out and say, man, I always shoot my shot. But we want a specific story of how either you won or you learned a life lesson. Give us that shoot your shot moment. All right, man. My entire life has been predicated on shooting my shot. So I probably got an arsenal of stories to be able to pick from. But let me think. Okay. Um, all right, I got a story for y'all. So my junior year, I had uh, gone to Cape Cod. I don't know if y'all heard of Cape Cod, but um, it's like the Hamptons of Massachusetts. It's like the beach town. And I decided to take a job as activities coordinator slash pool boy at a really high-end resort so i was all excited about it um summer's going great you meet a lot of people that are really well off doing well and as you see right now i'm still doing it i got my dallas gear on i always got something to rep my cowboys even though we're ass right now um i'm, I'm at the pool and i'm opening the door for a guest that comes in he has a cowboy's hat on and i start talking to him and we just start having a conversation how long are you going to be here for he ends up saying he's going to be here for five days and he's going to be at the pool every day. So he requests me as his cabana boy for every single day. It's like, all right, start having a good conversation. We're talking about the Cowboys. I think the third day came. And at that point he had been like, oh, like, have you ever been to a Cowboys game? I was like, I've never been to a Cowboys game, never been able to afford it. Um, it's my dream. It's like, all right, like, you know, finish the shift. And I was like, this guy might actually want to bring me out to Dallas for a game. I don't know who he is or what he does. So the next day came and there was an article that was actually written about me for um, an internship that I had done with the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation. We help a lot of the kids use sport as a vehicle to learn life lessons and to propel themselves beyond for what's going on. So I like I shared it with him. We talked. He's leaving and he's like, hey, like, give me your number. It would be nice to be able to bring you to a game. Like, all right. Didn't think nothing of it. I think it was like july he hits me up end of august randomly texts me um and he's like hey uh you know just checking in on you how's everything going are you excited for the season i was like i'm real excited for the season would love to be able to go to a game and he was like you want to go to a game all right let's make it happen so he sends me a flight tells me i could bring a boy with me get to the airport first time that i'm going to dallas get to dallas land at the airport and there's a limo there waiting to pick me up I'm like what the fuck is going on hop in the limo we get to a hotel we got a suite i've never seen shit like this before let's go so this all this is going down turns out you know the high school is named after this dude he's got a horse cutting stadium he's got like 15 car dealerships ended up maintaining that relationship but like we end up going to the game in a limo people are walking from miles away we pull up to the stadium and he's got a, he's got a sign with his name on it so we go inside and we're in the the founders club 
So all of a sudden, Moose is walking up to us. Aikman's walking up to us. I just like, I'm a kid in a candy shop, you know? Like, oh, can can you sign my hand? I don't got nothing else to have. <laughs> you sign this shit for me? So <laughs> this all goes down. Best experience in my life. That was in 20, 2008. End up maintaining a relationship with him, whatnot. 10 years pass and I'm with my girl at that point. I'm getting ready to propose. We've kept in touch, just checking in on each other. And I wanted to propose to her on the 50. So she is also a diehard Cowboys fan before we even met. So it was like one of my parameters on the on the dating apps. Must be Cowboys fan. <laughs> <laughs> she ends up, you know, like this whole thing goes down and, and I hit him up. I'm like, hey, I have this vision. And he's like, done. Blocks off the stadium, allows 30 of our friends and family to get there and get to the 50 yard line, propose to her. They got signs up. Will you marry me? And I look back at it and I'm like, holy shit, man. It was just from this conversation that I had with this dude while I was a pool boy, kept in touch with him. And then I asked. And the next thing you know, man, that memory is etched, you know? Man, hold on, man. I think you just solidified season five's best yeah. shoot your uh, shot. Uh, that might be the best shoot your and, and to be honest, I, I might have to get swim lessons now if that's, you know, because I can't swim. But if be, being that close to we'll neither, you, man, we, we, maybe I need to pick up that life skill here soon. <laughs> That's unbelievable. See, you see how the Cowboys bring, oh, no, bring, bring not, people, to that, that, people together? That's what it does. I need to bring the pros of this, man. That's what that's I'm saying. That's, you know? that's what it does, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, like, I love it. I love it. So uh, where, where did your love for sports start? In, in particular, we can get into the Cowboys, but where did your love for sports start? It was early, man, right? So um, I came up in a, in a tough family environment. My father wasn't really around um addiction you know so he he wasn't there and a lot of times we were moving around from city to city state to state i was in five different school systems before i uh before i even went to college so you know you like meeting new friends and whatnot but the only thing that like stayed true to me is i boxed since i was a kid and it's going to the park right like being at the park playing ball seeing people making a community through that and that that's kind of how i figured out I can make friends, not going into a school and being like, oh, here's the new kid, Millar, like, go meet him. So I was at the park every single day, Boys and Girls Club, came up on the Boys and Girls Club. And since that happened, man, it was just, uh, it, it just kind of downhill after that, right? It was a snowball rolling downhill and sports has just been everything to me. So you mentioned boxing and I want to get your you know thoughts on this. And ho hopefully this is not mess with any of your uh, professional life but you know my guy uh you know jake paul and, and and mike tyson were you able to get through some of the buffering um uh, to, to allow you on you know um not gonna say they were struggling a little bit and what did you think from a boxing from a boxer what did you think of the entire fighting situation so uh funny story i was at afrotech for the for the fight mm -hmm. and at the end of the fight i was with my boy rich and my boy dion um, I had just actually met Dion that day, but I had I had been on some Zooms with him. He's an engineering director at Netflix. So oh. we, had gone, <laughs> we had gone to the Rockets Clippers game right before that. We were all together and we're all fired up. Like right, we got to get back to Rich's house to be able to watch the fight, get to the get to the crib, put on the fight. And I personally, I was more excited for the Serrano fight. I'm a huge Serrano fan. Right. I think she got robbed. Um, I mean, Katie Taylor is a G, but Serrano got robbed. And the buffer there was two robber there were two robberies that night, but it continue. definitely was. Mm -hmm. So the buffering started during that fight. Heavy. So my G my <laughs> boy Dion is, you know, he's the engineering director. There's like maybe like eight of us in that room. And all of a sudden the buffering starts and everybody just starts looking at him and being like, Cap. No, what the <laughs> In on him, you know, and, and you, he's the best, he's an awesome guy. Like, we had such a great conversation. He's just sitting there, like, no, no, it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be like this. And so I, I'm like, <laughs> all of a sudden, like it's a third round of the of the Tyson fight, you know. So, like, nobody say nothing. So we're, we rewinded, everybody put their phone to the side. Uh personally <laughs> thought that that last fight was a joke, but I thought yes. that the Toronto Taylor fight was incredible, but I thought it was an absolute robbery, and I think uh judging and the scorecards and boxing has been a joke for years 
seen a lot of robberies through the years, but uh, that you don't do that to Serrano after that type of performance, man. You outlanded, you outland your opponent by over a hundred shots. You, I had her up like uh, six rounds to one at one point, and I like Katie Taylor had a little bit of a comeback. She was showing a little bit of grit, but an accidental headbutt is going to cause yeah. that. Get out of here, you know. Accidental. Uh, accidental. With Serrano called her out, like like all of hers, you know, she's been yeah. headbanging. So, <laughs> but yeah, you about a southpaw, like no, nah, that's not. You're fighting more than one southpaw in your life. You don't be throwing headbutts like that. Let, let me ask you. It, it, it's it's funny you say that. Uh, I don't know why boxing does this, but you you you've been in the ring. You know how to box. You know the styles. But it, it seems like everybody's an expert whenever a fight's on. What what about the sport? makes everybody an expert whenever they watch it social media brother twitter <laughs> the compu boxes the compu boxes so yeah. <laughs> how have we not fixed that yet right and and mh maybe it's because like everybody's been in a fight right like everybody hasn't dri driven a formula one car right everybody oh, hasn't sure. gone you know first and ten and third down and battle with people everybody has been in a fight whether it's been with your little brother or sister everybody's <laughs> either punch somebody or take a punch so right. maybe that's the earth of it right because it's maybe. not as you know that sweet science of boxing you know so they probably dumbed that down which it's <laughs> it is an art um but why haven't we fixed the copy serve right like why haven't we figured out some kind of uh something to fix the numbers because like when you saw the punches landed and thrown and like everything from her it was a it was a robbery it was a robbery and i thought it was obvious and you're right you know you got you got the mirror shadow boxers like I still do that, you know. I'm like, right, I still got it. Oh, but, you got that flat box still, you know. <laughs> you throwing the shoulders around, you're in the mirror, shadow boxing. But like, yeah, you know, every everybody's got something to say about the fight game. Everybody's really popped off on understanding UFC or trying to get into the the boxing reign in the last couple of years. Then you watch Tyson highlights, right? Like, nobody was tuning into Tyson pay per views in the '80s and '90s. Like, you watch highlights, right? So like. I'm excited that it's picked up and that there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of praise around the game, but everybody's a boxing expert these days. So besides boxing, was there any other sports that you were into, like, you know, coming up high school, high school days or anything like that? Uh, yeah, basketball. I mean, uh, I played football for one year, but basketball was really where I was at. I'm not going to get, I mean, I got, I got injured a ton during, uh, during high school, including, a senior year that I was really, really excited about because of a fight. So that's uh, that yeah shattered my hand the day before the season started. My boys still give me shit to this day, but um, basketball to this day, you know, like I still I still play ball. Um, college like went through the intramural. I stopped growing in eighth grade. I was five seven in eighth grade. <laughs> that's something like it's a wrap after that. Huh? Two inches all throughout after that. So it was like I got excited, man. You don't see many Indian dudes that are. That are growing like that. Like, Absolutely, hit that spurt, know the rap. Something, you know. I was already towering over my parents in eighth grade, and then all of a sudden, like, trajectory just dipped. <laughs> so you went. To, went oh, my fault. Go ahead, EJ. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Mate, Just bye. You, you you went to uh, high school in Massachusetts. So is 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 bass? Are the is the Celtics something that you support? Or not really? I mean, I'm a big Jalen Brown fan right now, but okay. uh, I grew up on. Penny Hardaway, Tracy McGrady, and then after T Mac, I just I followed T Mac around, right? So I was, he came to the Magic. Well, you follow a lot of places. You went a lot of places. I know, all over the place, brother. It was, <laughs> Penny to T Mac hey. was easy, right? I was Magic to Magic, and then I went to the Rockets, I went to the Pistons, I went to the Hawks, I went to the Spurs, I went to China. Overseas, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I'm about to say you went overseas. <laughs> and yeah, T Mac is uh, to this day my guy. You know, like I still got all his sneakers. Um, and again, you know, the, the injuries that he went through, if that didn't happen, I mean, he's still a Hall of Famer and that that shows the type of athlete and the type of impact that he had on this game. But if that didn't happen to him, who knows what this could have been, right? And I think that when they got signed and Grant Hill ended up getting injured right away, he he's carrying these teams by himself. And then same thing, you know, you go to Houston, they had that crazy win streak. I think it was like 17 in a row or something like that in the middle of the season. And Yao gets hurt. So he he wasn't given uh he, he wasn't given a lot of grace there. He didn't have no super teams, nothing like that. And he's always just been a G. And just moving around. And I mean, I like in the news now, T Mac is looking like they're partnering up with him and Vince are looking to um get ownership in the Bills, man. So you love to hear 
you know, like you said, the he's going through his career, but he's taking his bumps and bruises, but he's learning. Like you said, he's still a, a G through the whole thing. But I definitely love to hear the news of them, you know, going into ownership and and a lot of these guys transition, which we'll kind of get into um, when we talk about the in the game portion of, of the show. But just to see how they transition and, and doing what they can do to, to find some ownership in the bill. So that's really awesome. All right. So uh, what about I mean, the Patriots fan, I mean. You know, like, do you do you look at him at all with with the like? How did it become a Dallas fan versus a Patriots fan? Like, do you have any in like in state love for them at all? Like, give give, give me that. Nah, and I know he that, said no. Nah. All my boys that are Patriots fans are gonna hate me for this, but I don't support cheaters first and foremost. Number two, I've been a Cowboys fan since I was a, a kid, since I can remember, right? So, like, when I was young. um, a lot of shit happening within the family. So oftentimes I go to places for the summer. Um, I think I was four when uh, the first time that I had, my, my mom was like, all right, you're gonna go to your uncle's spot for the summer in Rhode Island, went to my uncle's spot. Um, I had two uncles there and both of them, Cowboys fans, obviously like you watching the Playmaker, you watching Showtime, you got eight, watching the trip triplets, right? You know, if you're coming up on football at that time, like that is football and they got national, national games going on so i got there and both of them diehard cowboys fans and that just really sparked my entire fandom and since then i haven't looked back it's been tough living in massachusetts like i moved around a ton but i've been in massachusetts for majority of my life and uh it's been tough you know especially through the dynasties and all that but i just try to pick the little shit you know like oh y'all steal signs you know, <laughs> the balls the flag, but yeah you can't you can't deny the goat you know brady is the goat he is elite he is incredible but i fucking hate to say it man <laughs> <laughs> no and that's what i'm saying because you know living there like right like um you know some of us have gone and grown up like i went through a phase where dallas was my team you know then i grew up you know some people grow out of you know you know so something in the bible says like you know as we grow we leave childish things and things like that you know what i'm saying but that's that's a whole nother story you know so i understand the triplet years and, and, and things like that so that's why i kind of wondered where that kind of kind of led to but how was it growing up in you know massachusetts right like being you know of indian descent right um you know there's a lot of players that we hear you know that talk about the struggles you know especially from an nba you know perspective like bill russell and some others that talk about how it was you know being in that city and in that community growing up it was um it was all right man i mean at the end of the day like when you're switching school districts every couple of years and you know you're, you're switching from multiple elementary schools going to a middle school where you meet new people going to a high school completely not knowing one person like you got to kind of you got to figure out a way, right? Like, what is your community? How are you going to fit in? And every single time you go, there's always going to be nerves. There's there's a lot of stress behind it. But looking back on it, it's I have friends from every single one of those school districts that I went to. Um, it's given me a lot in, in being able to actually fit in and being able to talk, being able to take people's perspectives. I've never been able in one click where I'm like, you know, fuck all these people. This is my crew. Like, I've always been somebody that understands or tries to understand the masses and looking back on it in hindsight, like at the time I hated it, right? I hated living in motel rooms. I, I hated living behind a convenience store. I hated being broke. I hated moving schools. I hated having to do all that stuff, but you look back on it at some point and it just kind of registers in your head that this, this is all for the best, you know, and it makes you who you are and uh, no difference, you know, like being in Massachusetts around that, like, my community's there, my family's there, um, everything that we're about is there now. And I, you know, looking back on it, there, there's nothing bad that I'm gonna say about it. Love it. And then you went ahead and went on to um, college there. So Amherst, you know, um, University of Massachusetts there. And um, so how did you get to your degree, right? So you did ultimately get into sports administration, but you also had a finance, right? You're going down the, the financials. So how did you choose those kind of lanes uh, when you were first going to school? So realistically, like I was, I was good at school. Um, I went to college. I had, I had a full ride going to UMass, but I went undecided. So I didn't know what degree I wanted to get, what I was going to get into. The community around us, it was all businessmen, right? Like hotel owners and convenience store owners. I knew I wasn't going to be a doctor. Um, mm -hmm. That's like you know one of the prototypical like, oh, you're Indian, like that's doctor. a family. 
you know, they got <laughs> fired up. And I was like, I know I'm not going to be a doctor. I don't want to do that to anybody. Um, <laughs> but when I, when I ended up uh, getting to school, went undeclared. And then I was like, all right, you know, they have a phenomenal business school. But sports has always been, again, like I was saying, at the precipice of everything that matters to me, that I care about, that I love. So I picked up finance and I'm like, all right, you know, you're going through the finance courses, but it, as much as like, it was fine, you know, I was like, all right, I'm going to get a good degree, but what am I going to do next? I was like, I'm, I'm pivoting. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I got a degree in sports management and UMass Amherst has one of the best sports management programs in the entire world. So applied, got in, um, and then that, you know, the rest was history. It was that sports management degree was, that was critical for me. It's awesome. I mean, I spent some time in uh, Massachusetts area, and I just uh, it's kind of incredible for how, if you look on the map, how small the state is. Like, I guess geographic territory wise, like the amount of colleges and universities and just education that's in that that region. Um, you th do you think that helped in you know as you moved into your career and you know the importance of college and your choice in college and your studies? That you think just kind of growing up around that naturally helped in some ways. I don't know. I mean, I thought, I thought like in my mind, it was, there was a period of my time where I was like, I don't give a shit about school. Like this is, this is life, right? You got to figure out how to fend for yourself, selling blow pops, selling airheads, like selling what you got to sell to make money. Um, so I didn't, you know, I wasn't looking at it until maybe I got into like my sophomore year of high school. I started feeling a lot more comfortable in high school and I was like, all right, like college is a reality. This is the way that I can actually bring my family and the next generation up. Um, but I wasn't ever like, oh, we're in we're in Massachusetts. There's the Harvard. There's the MITs. Like I knew that the school system that I was in was not one of the elites. So even if I finished top of my class, had a crazy SAT score, like I wasn't getting into any of the elite elite schools. The Colts weren't elite, man. <laughs> not <Nah>, bad. <laughs> I wasn't. Uh, that's that should be comp. I'm a pacer. Oh, you're a pacer. Okay, okay. So oh, yeah, 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 there it is. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, it was it was a it was an uphill battle there to be able to actually get in any of that. But I knew that I wanted to do something, you know, so um, a lot of it came from my employment at the Boys and Girls Club and like my member, like being a member at the Boys and Girls Club when I was younger. And that's kind of really like what propelled me into my career and like what I wanted to do. But that's never awesome. being in the city. Yeah. No, oh, man, definitely gonna get in that too as well. And um, so picking the picking the schools is great. You got a scholarship, and like was you know we always like to look at the alumni, but there's some uh, some strong alumni that, are, that are, hey. yeah, Doctor J definitely jumped right at me. You know what I mean? And then you can go, what did you? <laughs> there's a school still associated with the uh, uh, Doctor Bill Cosby. Um, you know it's. <laughs> I don't know. You know what, man? I don't think so. Uh, my favorite pizza spot out there, Antonio's. There used to be like a a Bill Cosby poster like right outside and they took it down um, yeah so i don't Damn. i don't know so rightfully you know. right i <laughs> yeah. mean you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's one of those things that we're not going to dive deep into <laughs> we're just going to leave that leave that there but no man really really dope stuff rick patino um i don't know if he like how his affiliation but like uh, that's what we saw and then of course um mrs x betty shabazz right like yeah <laughs> That's crazy. So it's just a strong, different alumni. And it's just like what you learn about those institutions, you know, after you kind of go through them. So um, and, and do you still affiliate or, or, or support or kind of connected with the university at all? I am. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I reach out to the I'm, I'm in contact with our sports management department quite a bit, like, you know, try to do things, try to go back and speak when I can. Um, but yeah, I mean, the you know, the sports community that's come out of UMass Amherst has been incredible, right? Ben Sherrington, he was a GM of Red Sox. He was incredible. Dr. J, Marcus Camby, really, you name it, man. You know, it's, there's a great network that came out of there despite, I guess, Victor Cruz, but fuck him. But none the, none, you know, nonetheless, he came through. We had a class together, Hunger in China. He did not pull his weight in the, in the, in the project. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, you know, <laughs> he didn't pull his weight, huh? I love it. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's jump into the career, man. So, I mean, Google, right? Like you, you see that. And, and of course, we, we always don't want to discount, but I believe we're going to get a little bit into your history um, once we talk about what your platform is. So we'll, we will cover some of that. But then we want to talk about your role at Google, man. And like, 
is Google like we saw in the internship with uh, Vince Vaughn and <laughs> Noah Wilson? You know, is it all about your Googliness over there? Like, what is it like, you know, working for the Google, right? Like, because it's, it's a, on a whole different level. Yeah, I mean, Googliness is definitely a thing. And <laughs> there are unlimited cafes and, you know, fire poles that you could take from floor three to floor two. And it's it's awesome. I would hope, like, if y'all ever visit Boston or we get an opportunity in whatever city to be able to link up, I'd love to bring y'all. But, yeah, they do so much to make the environment feel collaborative, fun, um, take care of you in terms of food, gyms massage like really you name it you know like you playing ping pong i mean you got all this stuff i can't tell you the last time that i really played ping pong or something like that but realistically uh all of this stuff exists and it, it's just like the internship that's awesome and then for that right like so i think what i want to focus on is a lot of people don't understand like you have a passion and you are able to roll your passion you know into what you do and, you know, you created, you know, this, you know, Pathfinder project, you know, the, the Beyond Sports. And that's how we kind of really first linked and just like was so interested in like the role and what it's doing. Can you give us in the audience a little bit about like how that passion, because you had other roles within Google and you still kind of have a lot of them, right? Like <laughs> Google employs Jamaicans because it looks like you got like five, <laughs> you know, projects that you roll yes. up. But tell us a little bit about that, though. And how yes. you got into it. So Google is one of these companies that really enable you to think outside the box, right? Like think about the ideas that you really care about, that you're really passionate about, work on them. And if they turn into something, then you could do something with it, right? So like when I first came into Google, I was um, like in a talent sourcing, uh, competitor analysis type of role where you're looking at the different pathways to get into Google. Traditionally at that point, like you're looking at elite universities like an MIT or Harvard, but I knew I didn't come from any of that, right? So when I'm looking at some of the strategies that were put in place, not just at Google, but in the tech industry holistically, you're thinking, oh man, like if if this is how we're looking at being able to actually find talent, then there's no way that we're gonna be able to build a Google that's reflective of our users. So I, within like a year and a half of starting Google, starting at Google, I started the Pathfinder. Um, at the time, it didn't have a name or anything. It was just like Project Bootcamp. But we started to work with uh, coding boot camps within our local cities, New York and Boston specifically. Um, one of my boys, Jacob, was handling the New York market. He was working with App Academy. And then I was working with a uh, boot camp in Boston called Resilient Coders. Resilient Coders was a uh, coding boot camp, like an immersive, in-depth, deep coding boot camp, four to six months, where they were working with students or individuals that were coming from combined family incomes of 30K or less and putting them through this accelerator program, but because they were they were high aptitude to learn coding. So you, I started volunteering with them, um, eventually started bringing them on site to Google and have them meet with our engineers. We'd run interview preps, like kind of assess where they're at with their coding skills. And the engineers that I was bringing on to meet with these kids were like, holy shit, these kids are fucking brilliant. Like these kids are legit, but they didn't have degrees. I mean, we had a degree requirement at that time. So like, all right, you know, like if they get a job elsewhere, that's still a win for me. Like I care about this. That's why I'm doing this. It's mm -hmm. not my, my core job. And then our degree requirement got rift, lifted. And all of a sudden our program blew up. We went from one partner to upwards of 60. And all of the folks that we were working with across these boot camps that were basically upskilling people that didn't have the means to go to college or that had picked the wrong degree, uh, whatever that might look like, but they were high aptitude. They knew what they were wanted to do. They knew how to go about the coding game. And then we were putting them through our program, getting the mentorship. And then all of a sudden we started hiring people. And the next thing you knew, we had a 1500 people that were coming through our program that were hired at Google and then probably about another 10,000 that were into the tech industry. That is unbelievable. And you, and you hit on a key word there that I, I kind of wanted to touch on, obviously with your background, the boys and girls club, the mentorship part, part of that touch on that. Yeah, it's critical, man. I think like anybody that's coming into a, any company, right? Like Google, obviously it's, it's a higher upsilon company, but you're coming in anywhere you have imposter syndrome, like you don't belong don't matter if it's on the basketball court, you see somebody that's elite, like I don't belong here. 
and that mentorship, that career coaching, like a lot of that really has predicated on being like, you do belong here. This is why you belong here. These are the skills that you actually have. And these are how they're going to translate. And you're going to be this person on the team that's going to be able to take the team from right here to right here. So we realized from talking to a lot of the students that were coming through our program that it was critical that they got to talk to people at Google that came from a similar background or had a similar story and be able to share it back, right? So like a big a big part of our model was that, like once a degree requirement was shifted, we ended up getting a lot of folks to come into Google through this pathway. Those people that came in then turned around and gave back to the same exact partners that we had as we continue to expand. We're like, hey, this is possible. That's phenomenal. And so that was, like you said, the initial path, the pathway that you created, right? Like in partnering with those universities and other people, just, just kind of like to get people involved. So the beyond sports pathway that you created, you know, talk to us about that. Like, you know, I, I can give the kind of the overview, but I mean, I'd rather get it from you, man. Like, I mean, I just think that program is amazing. And, and a percentage of what you do can't be explain on here because yes. it's amazing but like please please tell our audience a little bit about the uh beyond sports pathway yeah i appreciate that man so project pathfinder as a whole was founded probably about seven years ago and then maybe about like three years ago um that sports the sports in me like you know talking sports every day watching sports fantasy sports all this like it was a it was a big part of me and what i started to realize is i'm going back to my alma mater and talking to people that went through the sports management program when I'm talking to people at Google that had come from a former athletic background is that everything that you learn in a sports management program, everything that you learn uh, when you're thinking about the business sport, a lot of that is around the monetization of an athlete, right? But oftentimes you don't think about what is the athlete's worth if they're no longer making money for the league or for their commercials or, or whatever, right? And like 90 something percent of athletes fall into that category. So I was like, you know what, like, I need to be able to figure out how can I help a lot of these folks that are going through this, um, started working with like maybe one or two athletes, one off, like, hey, let me help you with your resume. Let me help you be able to tell a story around how your resume works and how you can take some of these skills or like all of these skills that you've developed, trying to get to the pinnacle of your industry and translate them over to everything else that exists, right? Teamwork, collaboration, all that. So started with that, working with a couple of people went off and then another shoot your shot moment. Uh, I had my daughter, I had paternity leave and I was like, all right, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, she was sleeping. It's like, let me send a note to the president of the National Basketball Retired Players Association and say, hey, we would love to help. And these are some of the things that I do personally. He responded within like an hour. So Shout out to Scott. Yeah, Scott. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Scott and I hopped on the call the next day, and he's like, hey, we're actually having a summer league event. I think the guys would actually love this. They'd appreciate this. Uh, why don't you all come through? And then the next thing you know, man, the, the program blew up. So we've been from – we went from just working with the NBRPA to – we got the NFL, the UFC, the WBC, WNBA. I'm in Kansas City right now for the NWSL. Uh, really, you name it, right? Like it's really blown up because we started to figure out that there's not just the career support bit. Like resumes is one thing, but there's so many different pockets within Google that actually apply to the sports industry or the athletes that are transitioning. And the second the program started to blow up, different pockets of Google started to reach out to me and being like, we can plug in here. We can plug in here. Now our program, we're up, we're up to like six, seven different offerings, which are critical now that's amazing and me and mh talk about this all the time right because and it's part of the platform too right that's why we do black and sports is the business side of sports and it's that transition from after you leave the game and a lot of people have a hard time even college right like i mean it's a little different now but you know uh, maybe it's even harder right because they're making nil money so what do you do when you're done with playing that sports that was your financial vehicle to go into the quote unquote real world. So man, that transition and, and like you said, and not only the athletes, their 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 support system, right? Their their spouses and things like that. Mm -hmm. So kudos, man. That that's great. But that transition is like one of the toughest things for a lot of athletes, you know, um, from from leaving the sport to the to the what's the next thing. 
Um, and yeah, I love the fact that that program has blown up, right? Because that's the one thing. So the um, the NFL, excuse me, the NBA PA, they do that around summer league here, actually in Las Vegas. And, you know, I've definitely uh, followed Scott and he's doing a great stuff and doing a lot of things for them. Um, how do you pick or, you know, kind of reach out or select what other events you do, right? So you just said you came back from Afrotech, right? Um, and I think that was with the NBA, you guys, that was that uh, partnership kind of doing that event. So how do you select um, what events or, or, or where to kind of um, go next? So Afrotech actually went through Google um, to be a part. We, we have a big sponsorship and a booth there. Um, the NBA Foundation was running like a scavenger hunt for about 100 local college kids. Afrotech facility, and we have a partnership with them, a relationship with them. So that's kind of how that came together. But from selecting it, man, it's honestly like the more conversations I'm having with executives, with uh you know, people and people across the leagues that really care, the easier it is to be like, we need to be there, right? Like Tracy Perlman, um, she is a, a VP at the NFL, reports up into Goodell, and she is so passionate. I met her at the NFL kickoff event in September, the right, like the day of the Chiefs um, Ravens game. And we just had maybe a 10 minute conversation that day. I listened to her on a panel and I was so inspired by her. So I gave her my business card. We had a conversation and you could see how much she genuinely gives a shit about making a difference in the life of the players on what's happening beyond, whether it's helping them get into broadcast, helping them with careers. So I immediately told myself, I'm like, hey, this is somebody that I want to and need to work with. Like whatever events Tracy has, I'm going to. So it's a lot of that, right? Like you see the passion in folks. Like is somebody just trying to check a box or does somebody give a shit about this work? If you give a shit, you're getting prioritized. And through your experience with the the Boys and Girls Club, I, I know I'm sure you run into different pro athletes as they transition at just different, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just how they feel about themselves. Self-esteem things and, you know, kind of get into that. Do you, you find yourself helping them navigate through to that personally and professionally when, when they're in those navigation processes? Yeah, man. I mean, I, I think it's all in one, right? Like I think the, it kind of blends in together. A lot of these athletes, like you are tied to your specific brand and your specific sport. You get a ton of clout. People are all about you. But the second that you get that one injury or your career is done or you have a shitty season, you don't get a second contract, you know, like what's going to happen. And this, these days and age, like, you go on Twitter and you throw up a goose egg, you have a bad game, like you're getting shit on, you're getting trashed. So like all these things actually like people forget about the human psyche and how some of these things can actually impact you personally, you know? So um, it's always kind of one and the same. Like Every time that we're talking about something from a professional standpoint, we're trying to tie that into your personal brand and your personal standpoint as well. So that's always been critical. Um, and then you know you run you run into a lot of these athletes that are that want to give back to their communities and want to give back to the youth because they've seen how this happens right and like those are those are people that we want to always work with right uh, one big example of this is Alan Houston right like I now consider him personally a friend he cares so much about the youth and he's created a Fizzle Foundation and the Alan Houston uh, Legacy Foundation and he is so tapped in to wanting to help the youth across the tri-state across the globe when you're working with folks like that and you kind of see that passion and you can hear that passion he don't got to do that but he wants and that, to and that energizes you right yeah that gets me fired up absolutely so <laughs> google is a now right like it's no longer what you do right like people don't say hey i'm going to go search this or i'm going to so it's like you know hey did you google that right and with that now, you guys have so many products. And, and with those products, you know, that's what you're sharing to people. How important is it for us? You know, not the, I mean, you do a lot with, of course, the athletes and the other, you know, Pathfinder projects or, or paths that you have. How important is it for us, you know, the listeners, myself, MH, to tap into those products and the offerings that Google have to get certified, right? Because there's like some certifications that, you know, I've seen other athletes that have gone through the program done. 
you know, how should we start tapping into that, right? Because, you know, they call it like, you know, one of our one of our media paths is YouTube that we do this visual show with. But, you know, <clears throat> what are the certificates and why are they important? And kind of t walk us through some of the things that we should be looking out for just to better prepare us in this kind of digital world. They're critical, man. I mean, the Grow With Google program has been growing significantly over the last several years. Um, the one that actually founded that was for IT support. She sits in the Boston office with me. Her name is Natalie Van Fleet. She is amazing. Um, but the program has gone from just one type of cert all the way up to, I think it's about eight now, but you're really touching on a bunch of different pathways into getting opportunities that touch over 2 million jobs in the job market, right? And again, not everybody can afford college. A lot of people might go to college and it's like, all right, like I got this degree. It don't mean shit. It's not what I want to do. These are pinpointed, right? Like it's four to six months self-paced. We try to create cohorts around them, but you could do everything from digital media and marketing, uh, UX design, uh, cybersecurity. And now we got two new uh, technical program management. And then the two new ones uh, is AI fundamentals and AI prompting. So a lot of people, yeah, yeah, those are massive, right? Like and one of the things that we're talking about tomorrow with some of the ladies here at the National Women's Soccer League Championship is going to be around how do you use a product like Google Gemini to make your life easy, to be more efficient, to be able to get your social media presence up. So it, they are critical, man. And it's not just about like, I'm going to take this course and now I'm going to get a job in this. It's about I'm going to take this course and I'm going to learn shit that is going to make my life better and easier. So they always say it, man, right? Like AI is not taking nobody's job. The people that know how to use AI and leverage AI are the ones that are going to take those jobs. Mark. What's your what's your relationships from your perspective with the different leagues? Is 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 this similarities in how they um, work with their former athletes or athletes, or is it a lot of differences from your perspective? There's a lot of differences, man. I think a lot of these a lot of um, leagues are starting to now understand how critical this is. Your alumni matter right like we were talking about where i went to school where y'all went to school like your alumni matter and the way that they perceive you matters right so i think leagues are getting a lot better about it there's certain sports that you know they want to keep the athlete and i'm not going to name i'm not going to name names or anything like that but there's certain sports that want to keep the athlete tied and loyal to that specific sport so you know if i go up to them and i'm like hey we can teach the athlete how to leverage AI, talk about what's next. Somebody might be like, nah, you know, I need them to know that they need to be loyal here. I don't want them to take another job because they need to be here. And then there's a whole host of leagues that are the complete opposite where it's, we want our people to figure out what's next. It's a success for us. The average retirement age across sports is like 26. It's a whole fucking host a life left after that, right? Like, what, what are you doing after that? That's so insignificant, you know, that's that's a, such an insignificant part of your life being 26, you think that it's all done. You got years to go beyond that. Not everybody's Brady, you know? Absolutely. MH, you ready for them quick hits? Yeah, I am. Give me uh, two seconds to pull these up. Absolutely. Um, oh, man. Go ahead. All right. So just, 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 some, just some quick hits for you about, you know, Yes or no type question, this or that type question for our listeners. So, uh, whiskey or wine? Whiskey. Okay. Text or call? Call. Pancakes or waffles? Wow. Pa I mean, it's got to be uh, pancakes, man. Okay. <laughs> so, wow. I, I mean, I think I know. Uh, I, know I, think it, I like chicken and waffles, but like uh, McGriddle was. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I mean, we asked everybody this. I, I can Apple or Android. I got. I gotta say Android. Yeah, I know. Say hey, PC. don't. Hey, first of all, don't say it you like know. that, man. Say it with pride. No, but I got. An, I got an iPhone. No, you know? no, we don't care about that, man. Yeah. I know. All right. Yeah, I'm a company Android. man. I'm a company man. Android. That's right. Android. Yeah. Early bird gets the worm or a late night grind. Late night grind. Kevin Hart or Cat Williams. Kevin Hart just wanted to go see him last weekend. That's why. <laughs> Hero or villain? Hero. 
Popcorn or chips? Chips. Is Cheeto a chip? <laughs> nah, but as long as uh, I don't, a Cheeto ain't a chip, right? Now what else is it? It come in the same packaging. It feels like popcorn. So the smart food comes in the same packaging too. That's true. Okay. Yeah. Would you rather have a shoe named after you or a ward named after you? Shoe. Okay, you're going to play it safe and go into overtime, or are you going to risk it and win it in regulation? Going to OT. One track that never gets old. Lose yourself. You Rocky movies, or you 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 like the Creed stuff? Rocky. It's not even a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, you taking uh, – Emmett or Michael Irvin? Emmett. Emmett or Troy Aikman? Emmett. Emmett or Des Bryant? Emmett. Emmett or Romo? Emmett. Emmett or Tony Darset? Emmett. Are Emmett or Deion Sanders? <sighs> that's that's like the biggest coin flip out there, but Emmett. <laughs> Deion was a 49er, you know? Ooh, I, let's go. Okay. Yeah. That, that is true. I'm, I'm good. It missed the one. So it missed the one for you. Emmett's Emmett is the one. Yeah, I would say that. I got I got a chance to kick it with him in person a couple of times. Had a lunch okay. with him. Went to his uh, grand opening in Vegas for his steakhouse. And yeah, he's one of those people. I know they they say that you don't want to meet your heroes. He was one Genuine. of those. Yeah, I, I genuinely enjoy meeting him. You got to ask him next time you see him why he's wearing those tight wristbands on his bicep when he won uh, Dancing with the Stars. You gotta ask him. Can you ask him that for me? Yeah, I'll ask him. I should. I should. I should text after this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love. I love the Cowboys. Emmett I mean, was my my guy. Dion was always my guy. I grew up wearing number twenty one, uh, just because of prime. And I know he did the 49ers uh, garbage, but you know he he's the one. That's what's up. That's all I got, man. I appreciate that, bro. Yeah, of course. I mean, Dion's a fucking G, man. I mean, I love Dion, but that 49ers, you know. Yeah, it the, the one wrinkle on the resume. Yeah, I, I, does Amy have his uh, does he even acknowledge his cardinal days? Hopefully, not. I don't, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> facts. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I was in there though, I think. Yeah, no, no, for real. Yeah, 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 he had a, he had a, he had a G was, there, so yeah, I love it. All right, let's get into the winner's uh platform. Um, I hope both of you guys can enter the winter circle with me, both being Dallas fans. But um, jumping into the – We've been there more than once. There's, there's, there's a lot of winter circles at yeah, the Cowboys. Been, bro. Okay. Uh, so in the winter circle, uh, this is the kind of where we talk about the platform of, um, you know, anything you're promoting or, or just something that's near and dear to you. And, you know, we definitely noticed this um, in our research and kind of why we led with, um, you know, you're a man of change. Um, you've been really heavily involved in change, and that starts at the ground level with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and it's so funny when we're looking at like some of the things and some of the things you shared with us, the Boys and Girls Club. Like, I never forget the first time I saw the Boys and Girls Club advertising when Denzel Washington was in it, right? Um, that was a really big campaign. I'm glad they did that because then it started highlighting other people to stand up and saying, like, hey, you know, that was a part of me too. And there's like, great. So the, if you go to, you know, the Boys and Girls Club, that's the banner that they have showing, like, you know, some of the people. Now, it's more people that look like us um, that have been through the Boys and Girls Club. Um, you know, I did see Sean White in this, this recent advertisement, but um, how did that, like, impact you, right? Like, because, you know, you said you had, a, like, a rough upbringing. Was that just because you spent time in there and you just really owe it, not a debt, but just kind of a, a, a more of a gratitude to uh, the Boys and Girls Club? Yeah, I would say that, man. Honestly, like, so right before high school, I found out that I wasn't going to be in Springfield anymore and I was going to go to a completely new school system. So I was at the park, um, local park, playing ball every day. And one of the days that we were out there, I was hot. I couldn't miss. So one of the kids that was there was like, hey, why don't you come to Open Gym at the Boys and Girls Club in Chicopee? It was like maybe like three miles away. It was the next day. So oh, I'll go. So I went and open gym was phenomenal i started to kind of be able to like express myself with people that were going through a lot of the same shit you know and um started going back every day whenever there was open gym started going back started going back and eventually 
I stopped feeling sorry for myself, right? And then I started taking that as being like, hey, this is, why would you feel sorry for yourself? Oh, there's a lot of people going through this type of stuff. Figure out what your next direction is on how to go forward and then be able to bring this impact back to these communities that are going through the same shit that you are. So ended up uh, staying there as a member for a couple of years. And then they offered me a job when I turned 16. So I was working there from 16 to like 22. And it's the Cal Ripken one that um, that you were doing? The- that was a part of it, right? So 16 okay. Part of their youth development counselor, working with the kids, um, you know, kind of helping them in their after school program with the sports, really, you name it. And then once I picked up sports management, the Boys and Girls Club was able to actually take an internship that I got with the Cal Ripken Senior Badges for Baseball program and integrate it into my specific Boys and Girls Club. That's and awesome. it, yeah, it just it really took off. Um, you know, ended up getting manager of the year, got asked to come to the Cal Ripken Gala to to speak about the impact that that program and the Boys and Girls Club had on one of the kids that I was mentoring. So really just kind of like a full circle moment. I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say that I feel like I owe a debt or anything like that, but I know the impact that this place had on me. And because of that, I genuinely want to be involved, right? So like I'm on the board of directors now for that very Boys and Girls Club. Um, I'm the only one that's an hour and a half away, but yet, I'll try to do everything that I can to be a part of it because it, it matters that much. Yeah. And, and, and the, the junior staff kind of uh, experience, I, I don't think and much appreciate to, I don't think a lot of them get as much as appreciations as they deserve uh, during that time. Cause you kind of have to be up really every day. You might be the brightest part of these young people's lives. I, you know, my, my dad uh, uh, in the military sense, but he ran boys and girls club programming through the military. And I, I grew up in the same way. I, did the youth of the year thing. So I just, I know the impact. Yeah. I know the impact uh, those programs have on, on youth and just kind of belonging, being a part of something. So uh, really shout out to you on that, but talk about the importance of the junior staff there. Man, it really, it really means everything. Uh, I won youth of the year as a junior staff there um, when I was 16, changed everything. Right. And I saw the same thing, right. For boys that I was working with, with people that I was starting to meet in that, in that uh, aspect. And was like, when I, when I figured out, that this is really an avenue for change. Like this is something that could really help you. A lot of a lot of my friends that I was um, starting to meet through ball and through sports and whatnot, I was like, hey, come to the Boys and Girls Club, come to the Boys and Girls Club. And a lot of them started to get jobs there. And you could really see the impact that it has because there's some level of, you want to call it selfish, whatever you want to call it, there's some level of gratitude that you get in helping somebody, you know, and especially kids. Like you're seeing what these kids are going through at their house, in their scenarios, they don't got a father, they don't got a mother, they don't got money, they don't got food. And if you can make a small impact in their life, if you can change something in their life, if you can teach them something, it, there is a, there's a level in you that it, it's like, this feels good, you know? It's a spark, and that's awesome, man. So you mentioned that you're on the board, uh, but you're also in the process of opening a brand new center. Like, that's big, and, and I think... You know, it's one thing to open a center, but you guys are really putting some bang behind this. Tell us about the center that you guys are getting ready to open. Yeah, so we're opening up a teen center. It's called Haven. Um, it's going to be the first of its kind in our city, right? So, like, our, our city has been rampant for years around drug use, kids dying at an early age, um, violence, you know, really, you name it. So this teen center that we're building called Haven, it, we want it to serve as an area. It's state-of-the-art. We've had a teen center below before, but it was just like a small little room. People go in, you talk, you bullshit. We're trying to put some actual programmatic support behind it. We want to have technology. We want to have life coaching. We want to have skills. And we want kids to be able to be able to come in here and leverage this and be able to kind of extract that potential, right? Like these are these are programs that we want the youth because all kids are born equally, right? It's your circumstances and what you're going through that really kind of navigate where you're going to end up, where you're going to end up. Right. And if you have an intersection to be able to go to a place like this for change and see the things that you're really good at, it might spark your curiosity to do the next thing. Right. Like a lot of these opportunities, it's just not top of mind for a lot of these kids. So being able to create a teen center like this and bring our youth that are actually in high school through this and being able to actually propel them to whether it's college or a cert program or a boot camp or whatever that looks like, 
it's it's a dream come true. And the fact that we're putting such a massive investment behind it means everything. Um, we're actively raising for it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that we're super proud of. Let's go. And an exclusive, you know, another Black and Sports exclusive, we, we dropped stuff. Um, you and your wife um, are planning a nonprofit, man. So tell us about that and like what sparked that. And then how do you believe like, cause it's providing educational resources, right? So give us a little uh, tidbit on that. And we'd love to hear that. And of course, we're definitely want to be supporters. I love that, man. Yeah. So my, I'm, that's another shoot your shot moment. The fact that I even have the girl that I got as a wife, like she is incredible. She's a wonderful woman. Um, she's genuine. She cares. She's a, a big sister in the big brothers, big sisters program that she's been doing for a while. And, she just genuinely wants to continuously give back and make an impact and make a change. So it's always been something that we talked about, but we are trying to build our lives together and, and get to a place where we can do this. Um, we have a daughter together now. Um, she is 17 months old, joy of our lives. And as we're seeing her kind of come up and we're seeing that we're in a different spot now where we can give her the type of life that we know that she deserves and that maybe me and her didn't have, we want to be able to do this for the future generations, right? So I'm blessed to be able to be at an incredible company like Google with supportive managers, with supportive teammates, with people that really genuinely care about this type of work and, and tie into it. But at the end of the day, like Google is my employer, you know, like I, we want to create something. We want to build a fundamental foundation to be able to do this for the rest of our lives, you know, whether that's five years, 10 years, or a hundred years, we want to be able to build a legacy around helping the future generations and we're not going to stop. Right. And that's going to, that doesn't, you know, we're going to help kids. We want to take this to, to countries, third world countries where we can bring some of these resources like Google certs or uh, just an AI ML upskilling on how can you use these resources to make your life better, whatever that looks like, we want to make sure that we're doing that um, and, and create that and build that legacy. Love it. So we got a name for it or are we just still doing the framework where we're so we're yeah, I mean, we got a name out there. It's the the name. I I got the domain name. I, I've had it for years, but it's called the Pathways Project. Uh, you know, it's it's still it's still in the uh, inception stages right now. Uh, we filed for it. We're, we're working through it, um, but I'm sure we're going to change courses and directions. The more that we meet with people, the more we see what the needs of the country and the needs of all these countries that we want to work with are. But Absolutely. at the root, of it, it's to, it's to help folks. So well, keep us involved, man. We'd love to always like to share that message. You know, we want to provide and support how we can. We want to tweet, text, post, however we can. So definitely keep us apart. But you know, this is not the last conversation that we have. <laughs> so you know, we're always going to have those conversations. But man, we're we're, we're coming to the close, and um, this is the part of the show we like to call the assist. All right. So this is where you get to kind of give your coaching gym, right? Or, or, or maybe even a, a mantra that you live by or maybe something you would tell your younger self. So give us that quick, um, quick coaching gym. Honestly, it's you can. Right. I know it's only two words, but you can. There is adversity that's thrown at us, at all of us. Right. Like everybody's struggles are their struggles. And if you've gone through one thing, I've gone through another thing. There's no delineation between whose struggles are worse or who's gone through worse like your struggle to you is your struggle to you and just make sure that you know that you can overcome it and you can right like you could do what you want to do and and that's just kind of the mantra that i that i've tried to live by and anytime that i'm feeling like i can't do something i just bring it back to that and being like there ain't shit that i can't do there it is you can i love it it makes final words no, I love it, man. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, we appreciate your time uh, joining us. I know you're on the East Coast, so it's a little later than it is here on the West Coast. So, you know, thanks for hanging out with us. And shout out to your wife as a Cowboys fan. We're going to get through it, uh, you know, together, you know. So we're we going to get through it. Prayers up. <laughs> Prayers up. Love it. Hey, well, I hope you enjoyed the show. We definitely uh, want to thank you a lot for coming on. Um, just extraordinary, man. And, and like, you know, appreciate the support that people don't know that. Um, so I want to say thank you for the support you provided the show and myself um, throughout the years. Uh, so thank you for, for making time and your flexibility, man. It, it's above and beyond. And we just want to say thank you, give you your flowers for not only what you have been doing 
for what you you know you're, you're kind of carrying on your legacy. So hey, I hope you all enjoyed the show. Uh, please share the show. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's someone that could use some of these nuggets and, and tidbits that were shared. Um, know that we drop a new show every Thursday, so you can please go to YouTube and subscribe because uh, if you see it, you can be it. Visual representation matters. And then if you're more of an audio person, uh, you can listen to our podcast anywhere you listen to um, audio podcasts. And like we always say, please, please stay safe, practice gratitude, and know we're rooting for you. Screaming, all us blacks got us forcing entertainment until we even. Too many are rooting for everybody that's black. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Too many I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yo. 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 Too many I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Spat bouts and racks on handmade new rags. Too many I'm rooting for everybody that's black. I serve everybody from sports to college class to rap. rap.